Hi, I'm Joe Hellerstein. I'm here to talk about new directions in cloud programming. This is joint work with my colleagues Alvin Chung, Natasha Crooks, and Matthew Milano. So there's an old story in computer science that with every new computing platform comes a programming environment that allows developers to do unexpected and wonderful things with that platform. And this goes back to the Turing Awards that were given out for Unix and C, which arose on the mini computer, but it applies to supercomputers with languages like Chapel and MPI. It applies to personal computers with the advent of graphical programming languages like HyperCard and LabVIEW that presaged what we now call low-code or no-code uh, programming models. And then, of course, smartphones with environments like Swift, um, Android, and app stores. Uh, the public cloud is certainly part of the latest version of the story along with smartphones. Interestingly though, the public cloud still doesn't have a programming model that natively unlocks its incredible power of the world's biggest computer with the most storage ever amassed by humankind. So to me, the big query is how will people program this remarkable environment in ways that third parties will be able to do unexpected and magical things using these resources. This is, if not the grand challenge, certainly one of the grand challenges in core computer science facing us in the next decade. Now, two years ago at this conference, I talked about serverless computing and how it was one step forward down this path but also two steps back. And I'll say that that paper was really an opening for us to then go do constructive systems work to try to show what serverless could be. And over the last couple of years, we've built out a serverless stack, the Anna Key Value Store, and the Cloudburst Stateful Functions as a Service system that demonstrate that you can get the benefits of serverless and yet still have super low latency I.O., have open networking so that functions can do distributed computation with each other, and get quite a remarkable amount of consistency, isolation, and fault tolerance despite the openness of the functions. And yet, serverless functions are really just sequential UDFs in the cloud. It's time now to turn to the big query and really ask how will programmers unlock the potential of this platform. It's not going to be just through serverless UDFs. What we're going to propose in this paper is what we call a new pact for cloud programming. So this is four independent and declarative facets that a program should have when it's being expressed by a programmer so that we can evolutionize cloud programming in the 20s. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. But these four facets are the program semantics. So think of the functionality of the program an availability declaration about how many tough independent failures you want to tolerate, a consistency declaration about what are the consistency models that you want on your APIs, and then targets for optimization to allow you to say what kinds of cost and performance you're willing to deal with. And the goal is to deliver this pact in a way that is comfortable for programmers to gradually get used to. And that's what we mean by evolutionizing programming. So, Programmers are going to specify each of these facets in isolation. So imagine the functionality of the program semantics are not intermixed with issues of consistency or availability or performance. You separate all of these out into separate facets. And this gives extreme clarity of intent. So now we don't have crazy uh, spaghetti code programs that have a mixture of the program semantics and some consistency guarantees that are mixed in or some availability concerns that are mixed in. Each of these things is done separately and therefore is changeable. So you can have a program declare all its functionality and change your mind about what consistency model you want without changing the program semantics code. Right? Similarly for availability or for your performance tolerances. Compare that to the complexity of our current distributed systems where these things are deeply intertwined. Another benefit here is not to the programmer, but to the infrastructure underneath, which is that each facet can have its own syntax, its own code generator. We can solve these problems somewhat separately. Uh, and we can solve them with modern tools. So we can do code generation via search and program synthesis rather than via traditional rule-based compilation. So let's look at each of these facets quickly. Program semantics, the idea is functionality, modulo distribution. So don't worry about all the distributed systems issues. Just tell me what it is you want your program to do. And this should be familiar in this community. It's a declarative specification of the internal representation of the compiler. So the internal representation language, the compiler's 
uh, native language will be declarative. But the truth is that that's not where programmers live today. And so to get where programmers live and to evolutionize the field, we're going to use what's called verified lifting, a technique that my colleague Alvin Chung pioneered, which takes things in a familiar programming framework, like sequential programs or object relational modeling programs, or perhaps distributed kind of design patterns like actors or promises and futures, Take any of those interfaces and then through a program synthesis technique called verified lifting, we output a declarative representation of the program with UDFs for any of the code we weren't able to translate. Okay, and so we can get from where we are today to this declarative future incrementally and automatically using verified lifting. On the availability facet, we want to tolerate F independent failures. This is pretty much the simplest facet. We have to declare our tolerance. What is F? Once you declare F, we will implement F plus one-way redundancy. There's many ways to compile that down. There's many ways to achieve redundancy, but uh, the key specification is what's your F. And we'll make the availability per API. So you can have one API that's very highly available. Another one may be less so because either it's less important to your application, or maybe it's expensive to maintain its availability. Say it uses GPUs, and you're willing to trade off its availability against its cost. So every API could have a different availability goal. You also need to declare your independence, so it's a nice thing to declare. Um, what correlations, essentially, do you want to ignore? So you might say, hey, virtual machines are likely to fail together unless they're separated in different data centers. So we might say our, in, our independence is across data centers, or we might insist our independence is across availability zones. So you get to declare these things uh, as a specification and change your declaration over time. Consistency, obviously one of the trickiest parts of distributed programming. And one of the key lessons in the last decade of distributed systems research, some of which came out of our community, is that you should do consistency at the application level. It should be application specific and not baked into the storage model. Uh, and once you do that, you can play all sorts of games like calm analysis to remove coordination from monotonic updates and other tricks that are in the literature. There are two different types of guarantees we'd like to approach. There's history-based guarantees that we're familiar with from the literature of reads and writes, like acid isolation and replica consistency from distributed systems. My colleague uh, Natasha Crooks has really interesting work in her PhD thesis that revisits all of these different kinds of history-based guarantees through the lens of client-centric views of the data, very similar to our visibility goal. And then property-based consistency is also important. So determinism of outcome. Maybe I'm not so worried about the internal updates, but I do want to make sure that the system at the end produces a computation that is a deterministic input to output mapping. Or maybe all I care about is not determinism, but just certain invariants should always hold, like foreign keys or uh, balances being greater than zero. So depending on what guarantees you want, we can give you different implementations of consistency. And then finally, targets for optimization. A thing to be clear about here is it's a multi-objective optimization. There's going to be at least two goals, cost and performance, right? And maybe more as you break them down. But our theme here is to start simple and enrich over time. We want to minimize client costs. So what does the client pay? Because these are pay-as-you-go models. And they can be subject to one of many pricing schemes, credit schemes, OK? And then we want to maximize performance. And particularly, we'd like to hit some response latency goals that the client sets. And this might be a distribution, like a median latency and a P99. OK, in our group at Berkeley, we're building out a new stack we call Hydro. It's a packed programming stack. In the top, a polyglot programming model. Um, hopefully, your favorite programming model for distributed programming. Maybe it's not distributed at all. We're going to put that all into the pot with hydraulic. That's the name of our verified lifting uh, compiler. It's going to use verified lifting to lift these lower level programming models into a packed model, which we call HydroLogic. So that's our declarative internal representation language. From HydroLogic, we have a compiler we're building to translate it down to something we call HydroFlow, which is another internal representation language that's more like Dataflow. Think of it as like a very souped up uh, relational algebra with iterators. But we're also going to have special case handling of lattices, so lattice flow, and then also handling of events and mutations in the uh, sort of flavor of uh, um, reactive programming. So we're going to integrate all those things into HydroFlow. And then finally, HydroFlow programs themselves will be binaries. We're implementing this in Rust. It's compiled down into binaries. And those binaries get deployed, but they don't get deployed statically. They adapt themselves. They spawn more of themselves or put themselves to bed and uh, generate fewer of themselves. So they auto-scale dynamically. 
So in the paper, you'll also find reasons to be optimistic that we can actually do this, including research from my colleagues as well as from the community. Uh, challenges ahead. This doesn't have faces because we're recruiting students and postdocs for this, uh, but lots of things to do. And then examples of syntax scenarios and translations from models like actors and futures into hydrologic to give you some confidence that um, this is all plausible. So I'll leave you with a few links here. Uh, the paper itself, our GitHub repo, uh, relevant blog post that I wrote for light reading, and a link to the Data Systems and Foundations group here at Berkeley, which has grown quite a lot. Have a look.